Happy Thursday, everybody. Welcome to Talking Stuff. I am Jeremy Birmingham. That's Andrew Ellis. We are talking about Ohio State football recruiting, and it would be weird to start this episode of Talking Stuff without diving into the latest thing that happened to the Ohio State football team, which I guess uh, is going to be pretty important in the world of recruiting, Andrew. That is the decision of Tony Alfred to leave Ohio State uh, and head to Michigan. It's it's kind of interesting just for a thousand reasons. I mean, we've talked about it a lot on the podcast daily and on Snap Judgments on, on Wednesday when it happened, but we haven't really taken a deeper dive into the recruiting side of it. And first and foremost, it's like the last couple weeks to months have felt just too easy. There hasn't been enough chaos, and now there's chaos, and thank goodness for that. Um, but in all sincerity, like when you lose a guy like Tony Alford, I, I think – the most interesting thing is the way his last nine years is viewed at Ohio State is like rightfully and justifiably. I think you can look at it and and think he was pretty darn good in his job at Ohio State. And then on the other hand, you have people who will argue that he was mediocre at his job at Ohio State when it came to recruiting specifically. And I think both sides of that argument can put together a reasonable debate. Um, but bottom line is Tony Alford was really loved by the guys in his running back room and a, a man that has a lot of respect of, from high school coaches around the country, players around the country. And it's a position where Ohio State has let him just recruit only running backs for the last nine years. So it's not like when he leaves out of the blue, you have existing relationships that are there between the running backs and other coaches on the staff, other than maybe Ryan Day and some some uh, extreme circumstances. but. I think that's why this, from a recruiting standpoint, feels like it's going to be kind of a big deal because it's March 14th, and at this point, you have to pretty much pause every single relationship you have with every single running back that Ohio State's recruiting. And by my count, there are 14, 13 running backs that Ohio State has offered in the class of 2025. Of that 13, I'd say maybe five or six, they have a real chance to to land in the cycle at this point. And now it's like pause on all of them. Yeah, it's uh, it's pause in the middle of March and there's a bunch of guys coming to campus in the next few weeks. So it's really going to be interested, interesting to see how Ryan Day kind of maneuvers through all this. Um, big picture wise, I, I was surprised by the move. I thought if he ever went somewhere. It might be at a school like Colorado State or something like that, maybe as a coordinator or a lower level head coach. Um, and certainly didn't expect it to happen in the middle of March in the midst of uh, spring camp. His history as a recruiter, um, I think it was kind of inconsistent. He'd have those cycles where he gets a Trey Henderson and Evan Pryor. And then he'd have those cycles where he misses on Kendall Milton, B. John Robinson, you know, Justice Haynes, Richard Young, the list goes on and on. Um, by all accounts, seems like a really good dude, though. So he's got, you know, I've never heard anybody really say a bad thing about him. But as far as the 2025 class goes, like you said, there's a handful of guys that Ohio State's in on. I mean, hell, there might be three of the best backs in the country that Ohio State, as of 48 hours ago, was the leader for. So I am fascinated to kind of see where all this goes here in the next coming weeks, I suppose. Yeah, and that's really the challenge is like because we don't know at this point if if you can even count on those names as being visitors now in the spring. Jordan Davison, uh, who I you know a lot, uh, he some places have him as the number one ranked running back in the country. Some have him as like the number ten ranked running back in the country. It doesn't really matter. He's a really good player and has been a priority target for Ohio State for well over a year. Him and his family are supposed to be on campus on April or March twenty seventh through April first for a four day visit. And now that's sort of up in the air. I talked to Jordan on Wednesday night, and he said, for now, that visit is, is still happening. He's hoping Ohio State hires someone he has a good relationship with. And it's like, okay, well, I mean, obviously, Ryan Day is not going to go out there and hire a player, a coach just because one player wants him. But, you know, it, you also are going to have a list of these 13 running backs that you've offered, and they're all going to have good relationships with different guys in different schools. So, uh, you can't do anything if you're Ryan Day in Ohio State other than find the best fit for Ohio State and Ryan Day and then let the chips fall where they may and hope that you have enough uh, cachet and enough like um, a, of a bond with in-state players like Marquise Davis or Bo Jackson to offset this this weird period or to mitigate this weird period because 
you don't know if you're going to have a running backs coach in the next week or if it's going to be three weeks. I mean, we assume it's going to be by the end of spring practice for Ohio State um, simply because the transfer portal will reopen at that point, and you've got to have somebody there when you have a room full of Travion Henderson, Quinshawn Judkins, Down Hayden, James Peoples, and um, uh, the same Williams Dixon. So, like, there, there, there's this, I think, belief out there that Ohio State needs to rush into this and hurry up, but at the same time, it's never really been Ryan Day's MO to do that. So, like, I don't know if we should expect something to quickly turn around by, like, Saturday or Sunday. But, like, I, I think Ohio State will begin the interview process with a number of guys um, probably as early as this weekend. And then you'll have to figure out, like, who who are those guys' best relationship with? And if it lines up with the players that you've already offered at Ohio State, then great. But if it doesn't, then it's like you're completely recalibrating and, and starting from scratch. Right. And you specifically mentioned Jordan Davison, who's probably the number one guy on the list right now. And he would like to see Ohio State maybe get somebody that he's got a relationship with. And I mean, he's he's got a top group of what, like maybe three or four schools now that are realistic landing spots for him. So if you're Ohio State, and you, you know, have to Ohio look at State, it's Oregon, it's Texas, it's Alabama. Uh, we will see if Michigan now gets into that mix with Tony Alford there. But, you know, Ohio State, it, we've all talked just you and I offline, like, the names we've said multiple times have been to shard choice at Texas, um, you know, Robert Gillespie at Alabama. So like, those are the names that we're like going, Oh, that, that'd be the dream scenario, but are they realistic? Yeah, exactly. I mean, if, if it's going to be somebody that he's tight with you, the first place to look would be at those schools. And again, we know day's not going to hire somebody strictly for one recruit, but those guys are all, you know, elite at their jobs too. So I don't know. I'm fascinated to kind of see what the timeline, the turnaround time is going to be with this. Other programs are in the midst of spring camp, some of them on spring break right now. Um, I think another part of this that's going to be important is, you know, Ryan Day's got his hands on every recruitment. But I yeah. imagine, and you would know better than I, if he's got a better relationship with some of these top guys compared to some of the others right now. Well, it's unfortunate because what you what he's been attempting to do this offseason is to – fall back into that CEO role that gets talked about all the time. And now he's being asked to make sure his hands are all over this recruitment or recruiting this position. Like we, we chip Kelly comes in and we don't expect that he's going to be like a light the world on fire recruiter. And a lot of the explanation or the way that people have explained that away is saying, Oh, Ryan day will just be the guy who recruits the quarterbacks. And now he's in a position in the middle of March where if these guys visit and Marquise Davis has said, he's not sure if he's even going to visit now in the spring, the Jordan Davis and visit is obviously one that's been in the works for a year. The kid lives out in Los Angeles and it, he hasn't been on campus since last June. He's circled these four dates a, as the time to get back. And if it doesn't happen now, I, I don't know, you can almost say it's unlikely to happen at all. Um, so it is pretty important that Ryan day takes that by the horns, but at the same time, he's got to figure out who his next running backs coach is. So, like I, I asked Jordan Davison straight up, like, did you talk to Ryan Day on Wednesday or did you talk? And, and he said, no, I talked to other coaches. I know Coach Day has been busy trying to figure out what they're doing. So, like, you hope that these running backs and these prospects around the country that you have or that the program has a relationship with understand the scenario. But again, it, it's sort of the catch 22 when you have a really effective relationship builder as a recruiter. And, and Tony offered certainly that. But then, you know, the guys like Brian Hartline someone that seems like Larry Johnson is James Laurinaitis, et cetera. Like if that guy leaves, it's not easy at this point to just say, Oh, you're recruiting by the school. The program's recruiting you like kids as, as much as they want to say, Oh, I'm not being, I'm not going there for one coach. Like generally speaking, that's what they are doing. They are going there for one coach. Uh, whether that was Nick Saban at Alabama or Robert Gillespie at Alabama, uh, you know, these kids are going to these schools for one coach. Um, and so now you have a scenario where that coach is gone and not only is he gone, he's at your biggest rival and will now be recruiting for that school. And you, that's, that's weird, man. Like it's, it's weird for these kids to have to deal with. And you find more and more kids are getting hip to the idea that this is like a very funky business and it, anything can happen. And I don't think that anyone will hold this against Ohio state, but like at the same time, they're having to make decisions that are based on their best relationships. And so now Ohio state like falls down that ladder without by no fault of its own, really. Right. And and they could very well hire a guy that we're not even really talking about right now, whether it's from a different college or maybe it's like an NFL guy or something like that. I have no idea. I'm just spitballing here, 
But the names that we're talking about right now compared to the names we're going to be talking about in a couple of weeks from now, I mean, it could be, it just could be a completely different running back board. I mean, I don't expect yeah. that to happen, but you, you really never know. It just depends on who they, uh, who they pluck away from whatever other school or, or whatever other program or team or whatever, I guess. Well, I mean, the good news is Tony Alford can't sign 13 running backs at Michigan, right? Seems unlikely. Um, we, you don't know if, if Jordan Davison has any real interest in Michigan, Byron Lewis. I, I mean, we saw him tweet something the eyeballs or whatever, when the, the announcement was made, um, Waltez Clark down in Tampa is another guy that Tony Alford has been recruiting pretty hard. He's committed to Florida, but he's a guy that Tony Alford had been recruiting hard. Uh, Tory Blaylock in Texas is someone Ohio state's been very in on Donovan Johnson at IMG. And then of course the Ohio kids with Marquise Davis and Bo Jackson, like, Marquise Davis, we've talked uh, at length about already. Like the 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 worry about Michigan with him was pretty real as it were, and now obviously that uh, you know becomes a bigger deal. Um, he's not in a hurry to make a decision. And I think that helps Ohio State, but none of these kids really seem like they're pressing the issue. And uh, when you look back, I mean, if I wanted to go conspiracy theorist, which I'm not, and I, I know this is probably going to get clipped, and people will say, but like. Is sometimes you can say, well, why wasn't Tony Alford recruiting Marquise Davis and these guys harder than he has been? Maybe, you know, like, well, maybe there's a reason why. <laughs> That's, again, conspiracy theory. I'm not I'm not really saying that. I'm just saying I'm sure people have thought it, you know. Yeah, I know. Um, I, I guess if it, just putting the ball in your court, if you're Ryan Day or Bjork or whatever, and you had to go out there and just get one guy, who who would that guy be? I mean, I really love the idea of Tashard Choice. I, I inadvertently and incorrectly said that he's a Texas alum. He's not. He went to Georgia Tech. So it's not like he's a guy that's in love. I mean, Texas plays pretty well. I know that. I don't know what he's making. Let's see if we can pull up his uh, his salary because that's really what this is all going to come down to. That's the reason ultimately that Tony Alfred left Ohio State. So salary is going to matter. Um, I'm guessing it's like I'm guessing seven or eight hundred k. That's a that's just a guess. It says uh, only five hundred and fifty in the most recent thing that I can find, but that's from last year. So I assume he's up to probably seven hundred. So I mean, it's more than it, Ohio State was certainly paying Tony Alford more than that before, um, and, and that's the thing. Like Ohio State, Tony Alford was one of the highest paid running backs coaches in the country. Um, so it's not like the Buckeyes were being cheap there. Michigan went in with a, a little bit more money. Um, one extra year on the deal and the run game coordinator title, which Tony Alfred held at Ohio State three years ago and lost. So, I mean, you can understand from his perspective some of the decision-making process, but um, it's not a situation where any coach in the country, Ohio State, is going to be uh, walking into the nego negotiation going, oh, we can't pay that because they're paying their running backs coach more than pretty much everybody in the country is. Um, I don't know what Robert Gillespie is now making at Alabama with the uh, new staff there, whatever it took to retain him. But even that, even if it's a, a million, like Ohio State will will go do that if that's what it takes to get the right guy. Um, so to me, I, it's to shard choice. I'd Gillespie's recruiting prowess is pretty obvious. If you look down the list of guys he's been the primary recruiter for at Alabama, it's pretty exceptional. And the one thing I like about him is that he played at Florida uh, he's a kid, is a, a, um, a guy that would pretty much replace Alfred like for like in recruiting that state. Uh, because while we talk about Tony Alfred and the recruiting individual running backs a lot, he also was the Ohio State primary area recruiter for Tampa, for Orlando, for Cleveland. So there's a lot of places where he was the point of contact for coaches to get in in good graces with people. So like even I I mean, he's not at Ohio State's program anymore, but like Kai Stokes, for example, like Tony Alford started that recruitment with Kai Stokes and Nick Petit Frere, like that started with Tony Alford being in that area and then Greg Schiano being involved at, at Berkeley because of of uh, personal ties there. So like it, Alford's involvement has not always been has not always borne itself out as far as like individual success, but like He's been pretty instrumental for Ohio State in, in some key areas, Virginia, Florida, Ohio. Um, so like that is where you start to go, okay, how do you replace that? And to me, Gillespie would would handle that. But Alabama's not going to let him go without a fight. So we'll see how committed they are or how interested Ohio State really is. So that 
I mean, there's a lot of names though. I, I talked two months ago in jest about not really even in jest about like Eddie George would be the perfect fit, but if he wants to be a head coach right now at Tennessee State, it's kind of hard to tell him, hey, stop being a head coach. Yeah. And, you know, how much does he want to go out on the road and recruit and stuff like that? I mean, obviously. Well, I mean, Deion Sanders never went out on the road. Do you think Eddie George would have to? Yeah, I guess that's a good point. So, I, I don't know. I, I'm fascinated to see where this all goes and what the turnaround time is going to look like. Hopefully, it's not too long just with the, just with the list of visitors coming in this month. So. Yeah, I mean, there are coaches out there that are not really being talked about at at that much. I mean, Sam Drayton is a name that people are are starting to spend a little time sniffing and back around on on Thursday. But you know, he's a head coach, so if you think about it from that perspective, if Ohio State could entice a sitting head coach, one who may be getting fired in the near future because Temple kind of stinks, but I don't know that that's Sam Drayton's fault. Like, can you win at Temple? I don't know. I, I don't know that you can, but. Um, if you can bring Stan Drayton in, you you at least have that thing to point to and be like, look, here's another guy who not only recruited and developed Ezekiel Elliott, who is still like the the standard that a lot of running backs around the country, like these young running backs, they still remember like Zeke was the guy that made them want to be a running back. So um, you do have that capability, but I don't know that he's like the dial mover that people would want at this point. Um, like a guy like Gillespie or DeMarco Murray would be. Yeah, I agree. But I'm I'm with you on that. Uh, Gillespie, Tashard Choice, and DeMarco Murray are probably the the tier one group for me. And uh, I'm I don't know if it's going to be one of those guys or not, or if it's going to be somebody we've never heard of in our lives. So we'll see. I bet it's someone we've heard of. Um, you know, but it, it, as we look at this though, heading into the next couple weeks, the Jordan Davison decision now is: Do you visit? And that becomes an extremely important side story for Ohio State over these next few weeks because we we spent the last month talking about running back and how they're definitely going to need to take two, right? So now you lose Tony Alford, and we all see the internet speculation about guys who could leave with him. I mean, there was already rumors about James Peoples being uh, disgruntled about it, which you'd understand if he was. I don't know how he would blame Ohio State for it. I mean, but that is what it is. So now you you obviously head into the 2024 season expecting it to be the final year for Travion Henderson and Quinshaw Judkins. And now the the real questions will come up about Down Hayden and James Peoples and probably Sam Williams Dixon to a lesser degree, but between a Tennessee born kid and Dallas Hay, Down Hayden and a Texan in, in James Peoples, like now you might need three running backs in that class. So like there's a there's some real workload that's coming for that next coach. Um, maybe you find one of those guys in the portal and two in the in high school, but like that's it's a it's a pretty heavy load to walk into as your first gig or your first job at Ohio State. Yeah, it is, and and I'm sure those guys you just mentioned are still fairly shell shocked. I mean this this news just went down a little over a day ago, so I mean who knows where their heads will be 48 48 hours from now? But I would like to think all of them would stick around, but I, that's just pure speculation on my part. Yeah. I mean, the transfer portal doesn't open for a month. They are all on spring break. I would imagine all five of those guys will return to Columbus on, on Saturday and be ready for practice next week. And then we'll see how the next month goes. But again, that's why there's this weird, like weird timeline that Ryan day has to kind of operate on that. He doesn't really want to, but like he, you are somewhat forced to say, okay, how long can we go before we owe it to these kids to have a relationship started with their new coach? Because if you wait until the day before the spring game, like I don't know if that's going to cut it. You're going to have a lot of people on in limbo that nobody wants to be in. It is what it is. Yep, is this it is. The, is this the most surprising like coaching move decision f from an Ohio State assistant or one way or the other coming or going for Ohio State that you can remember? Is there anyone that's more surprising? I I mean, I can't think of anyone off the top of my head, but like five days ago, one of my buddies sent me a screenshot from a Michigan site about this alleged running back coach being a stunner. And that Tony Offord was the first name that came into my head just because that would, that would be, and was in fact a stunner. So I, I guess I was like, it was kind of in the back of my head there, but I wasn't like expecting it by any means, but to answer your question, no, I can't think of another similar situation that, kind of caught everybody off guard like this. 
Yeah. And again, I'm not sure exactly. And this is the last thing I'll say about it. And then we can never talk about the decision again. But, but I don't know that it should be a surprise. Like Ohio State was on the precipice of moving on from Tony Alford in January. That's not a secret. Everyone's pretty much aware of it. Um, when new contracts were were given out, like his was a one-year deal, not the two-year deal that's standard for um, Ohio State assistance. He was coming back this year on a pay cut. Like it, it now you put all those things together and it does make you wonder why he didn't leave for USC or Miami or Notre Dame or, you know, one of these other spots that were available to him back in January um, or February even. And because I mean, hell USC just hired their running backs coach, what three weeks ago, right. From, from TCU. So like it does make you wonder why not take one of those jobs, one of those jobs, obviously Michigan probably paid a little bit more. Um, and so if that's ultimately what it came down to, again, it's hard to like judge the guy for it, but it just seems weird timeline and all the other reasons that have already been beaten to death. Um, you know, what hasn't been beaten to death, Brian Hartline on the recruiting trail. He hasn't really been beaten at all on the recruiting trail. And that's why when a five-star LSU commit decides he's going to visit Ohio state, it's worth talking about. We sort of brush off and scoff at the notion of some positions and some guys when they visit it's like yeah we know that's for no that's for for fun you know but guys aren't doing photo shoots anymore on visit so it's not just to come in and get your picture taken um and decorian and moore duncanville high school in texas five star number one ranked wide receiver lsu commit for a year is visiting ohio state on monday he'll be there monday and tuesday and like the ears need to be up, up when it comes to this recruitment, because from what I've heard uh, from people around Texas is that he is legitimately interested in reopening his recruitment. Um, he may not do it. He may not decommit from LSU, but the fact that he's come out and said, I think it was to Mike Roach at 247 Sports last week, like he's focused on four schools and that's it from now on. Like when, when, when committed players are putting out a top schools list, like it seems to me that we've entered in into the weird total abyss of college football recruiting, but uh, whatever. Um, but it's Ohio State, it's Oregon, it's Texas and LSU. And at the risk of pissing off a lot of people, I would go so far as to say that today, March 14th, that I would I would think LSU has the lowest shot of any of those four schools to sign. So that I can, you think I'm crazy? No, I was actually going to say that in my mind, Ohio State or Texas are the most likely landing spots right now. Um, not really based off of anything definitive or any secret intel or anything like that. He just kind of seems like a kid that's not going to sign with LSU. Um, I know he was just there. I know he's got a relationship with Underwood, the quarterback commit and everything. LSU's put receivers in the NFL plenty, but... Yeah. I don't know. I'm guessing Ohio State or Texas, but that's just a, a hunch on my on my end. Yeah, I asked him because this is a relationship that Ohio State and Brian Hartline really tried to like make happen a year ago and just couldn't do it for whatever reason. And and I, and I asked DeCorian Moore two nights ago. We were having a little conversation in, on DMs, and I I asked him why it was like slow build in the relationship. And he said, I had built strong relationships early and I was ready to shut down all the schools that weren't as serious about me. And I thought that that was right when coach Hartline had started to reach out. So we just kind of disconnected and now we're back at it. So like it, it's, it's a much better relationship than probably is getting discussed or has been discussed. It's starting to be talked about more now, but the fact that he's immediately coming and making this visit is, is, is telling and it's important to, not discount Ohio State at the in the recruitment. Devin Sanchez and his family have been very involved. Um, Ohio State recruiting the state of Texas extremely hard. They would love to be able to add a, a player like DeCorey Moore, who I watched him play in the state championship game against Devin Sanchez and North Shore High School in December. And those two weren't matched up often. Um, and Duncanville was able to run the ball all over North Shore that day, but there is something electric about DeCorian Moore. He's not the big receiver that Ohio State has been uh, stocking up on the last few years. He's maybe probably a hair under six one, maybe six foot even. But like that dude can flat out move, and 
if you're talking about like the Garrett Wilson comparisons, like that sort of twitched up athlete, like that's what Degorian Moore is. And if you can put him in a wide receiver group in this class, that includes Javon Boggs. Um, and then you start to figure out the next wave of guys who include Decorey and Moore, like that becomes a much different group than Ohio State's recruited in the last few years, like I said, because there's not like a real big guy. You go down the list, like Kalik Lockett at 6'2 is probably the biggest of the receivers Ohio State's actually recruiting in this cycle. Who else? Philip Bell, 6'2. Um, that's about it. So this will be a, a class that is smaller size wise than Brian Hartline has uh, recruited in the last few, but like that's increases the need for those just pure, like filthy, nasty dudes with the ball in their hand. And that's what the Corey Moore is. Yeah. His uh, highlight tape is impressive. Uh, that kid's got some wheels. Um, you got to remember, they don't all come out of high school or while they're in high school, they don't all look like Jeremiah Smith. So those different body types, um, but yeah, just getting him on campus is big. Um, and then, We'll see if any reopening of the recruitment happens. And then, of course, getting him back for an official and I guess go from there. That's all you can ask for at this point. Yeah. I mean, he's 10 5 in the 100. I mean, he's, he's a blistering fast um, and he will get bigger and stronger. But he's like, he's a type of player Ohio State does not have on the roster uh, at this point. And, and that is what makes it interesting. Aside from the fact that, again, it's a relationship that felt sort of DOA for a long time. Um, and it's, starting to get there I, I was told about it about six weeks ago like hey pay attention to this um and here we are we'll see i would expect that he'll take an official visit to ohio state in june and is provided that next weekend's or next monday's trip goes well because it will be his first visit and you know what's funny though generally speaking visits go pretty good i've, I've heard that's true i've very, very rarely do i hear about a uh bad visit to ohio state so hopefully that trend continues no one's ever like goes on and, and when they get the call from the media and says, how was your visit? This place sucked. Everything was awful. The food was garbage. The buildings were 60 years old. And then I hated everything about it and, and enough about temple. And let's, let's talk about other stuff. Um, just that's a, that was, that was a callback, Andrew, a joke. Do you, do you remember the photo of Deshaun hand when he was visiting Ohio state with Tim settle and he looked like the most miserable human yeah ever in the history of recruiting Understand I, I vividly, yeah that was, were, that was fun yeah there were a lot of uh behind the scenes stories about things that were going on with the sean hand that weekend and and uh that made him unhappy about ohio state apparently interesting i mean uh, even that it, even that like the the comments coming out of the visit weren't like well by the way like yeah i mean what happens you not every football player despite the fact that they all have a lot of shared interests and commonalities um they're not all going to get along and uh deshaun hand as the number one ranked player in the country at the time came in apparently a little bit high on himself and the players that played on the ohio state football team apparently did not like that so that's what happens there's a lot to, to talk about um we're gonna try to get into the four minute drill here and a four minute offense. What do we call it? The four minute drill offense, the four minute offense, the four minute drill. I don't know. Yeah, it ends up being like 40 minutes every time, but oh yeah. Well. So we're going to dive into that now because uh, obviously this is an off week for Ohio State spring break. Not, nothing happening on campus. Last week had a number of visitors come into town, um, mostly local. Next week we'll really start the national stuff. But Andrew, I wanted to just open up the floor to you here and let's dive into what we're, what, what's ever on your mind. So, um, Damien, it's Damien, right? Shanklin. Yeah. First name. Damien. Okay. Yeah. So he was offered last week as you expected when he visited on Thursday. Um, is it too late? Not too late. Notre Dame's probably the favorite. He's visiting sec schools or where do you, where do you think Ohio state's at now that they've actually offered? I mean, it's not too late, but it is imperative that the relationship not be put into this category of, Oh, it'll take care of itself. I mean, Ohio State is the dream school, the dreaded dream school. Everyone hates that term. Uh, the relationship with Larry Johnson has been good over the last month and a half, two months, as he waited to come to campus to get this offer. Buckeyes wanted him back on campus for their spring game. He has a track meet, so he can't make it. And now you just start planning ahead for that um, May, late May, early June official visit and hope that you 
are able to keep him from falling in love somewhere else. And that is going to be entirely dependent on how aggressive and how involved Larry Johnson, Brandon Jordan, um, and Alan Clark are going to be over these next six weeks because those three guys, the Ohio State pass rush contingency, will tell the tale of that recruitment, but also every other defensive lineman that they're recruiting because um, – I, I was talked about it on the radio uh, on 97.1 The Fan in Columbus on Thursday morning. And I, I mentioned that Tony Alford is like an old school recruiter. And I immediately, uh, somebody on Twitter asked me, like, what does that mean? Um, and I, Larry Johnson is someone I consider an old school recruiter, which is, oh, I'm recruiting you. I'm trying to get to know you as a person, but, and I care about you. I want the, I want great things for you. If I'm putting my time into building this relationship, it's because I value you. And, but I'm not going to, chase you i'm not going to call you every day i'm not going to text you good morning i'm not going to send you good night texts like uh, it's not that type of thing i'm not going to send you funny memes during the day like we're going to talk about ball and we're going to talk about real life and if you're not interested in those things then you may not be for me it, it's also guys that if if the players that they're recruiting aren't reciprocating like that sort of that interest and that sort of sincerity in the relationship that those old school coaches, as I would call them, the old school recruiters move on and they don't get, they don't waste their time um, trying to placate a teenager's fickle emotions. So uh, it's really up to those guys to understand that Shanklin is very serious about Ohio state and was very serious about Ohio state before the offer and to make sure that these next seven or eight weeks are are about a real solid base and not just superficial stuff that's going to a, a check in every week to say, hey, are you still feeling Ohio State? Uh, you know, like it's got to be real. And these kids are smart enough to know when it's not. So, um, you know, Larry Johnson is so good at that part of the game and that part of the recruiting stuff. But I do hope or wonder or believe that for Ohio State's purposes, that's why Alan Clark and Brandon Jordan are so important because they can do a lot of the the daily stuff, the minutia, and uh, we'll see how it pays off. But it's it's a real thing for sure. He's definitely – you'd have to have him in that top group of one or two defensive ends that, that you'd expect to end up in this class at this point. Would you say he's kind of in the same tier as that Marion Dye kid from Indiana? Like are they both guys they would absolutely take right now? Is that your – Impression. They would absolutely take them both right now. Um, they are similar players. I mean, that's that's what you're looking at, really, is that they're both in that six foot four, six foot five, two hundred and thirty pound range. They're more of your weak side defensive ends, like true edge rusher. Um, and so that's something that they need desperately in the class. Um, you know, the, the, I, I'm also, you know, I, I think there's other guys like JV and Hilson, who's committed to Florida State now, was committed to Alabama. He's a teammate of Javen Boggs at Coco in Florida. Um, like he's still in that conversation. Obviously you have Zaheer Mathis, but you have Justin Hill at that spot too. So like, it's not a spot where you're rushing, you know, because Ohio state is waiting for Justin Hill to do things. Um, I like Mary and I quite a bit. He's a little more raw, I think than Shanklin, who's a little bit more polished right now, but they could easily take them both. Cause Mary they probably need six defensive lines in this, six defensive linemen in this class. Right, right. Exactly. Um, switching over to the other side of the ball, just quick hitters, couple offensive tackles, um, one very big name offensive tackle and one a little bit lesser. So we'll start with the Ohio guy. So Nolan Davenport also visited last week. I believe it was, we talked about him maybe getting offered. Hasn't happened. Is that just plain and simple, uh, come back camp, show how you've developed, grow all that kind of stuff. And then earn the offer. Is that pretty, pretty much what's going on there? Yeah, that's how it seems. Uh, he, I'll tell you what, watching Nolan Davenport walk around at the Woody Hayes Athletic Center last Thursday, like he's pretty big. Like you can see what the promise there is, and you can see that he, he's got the body and the frame that Ohio State's going to really like at tackle. He did not get the offer, uh, as you mentioned last week, and there was some thought that maybe he would. I mean, I, I, I believe that I, I thought he would based on the conversations we'd had. Um, what, what I think is interesting is that he has basically not talk to anybody about the visit yet, which is interesting based on the fact that an in-state kid would be normally pretty stoked to get out and talk about that. Um, but he has not responded to anything I've sent him or, you know, I don't know about anyone else. So I'm not sure if he was disappointed. He didn't get the offer. If that was like a, a letdown. Um, 
but I'm I'm confident that Justin Fry and, and Ohio State is letting him know what's needed from here. And I would be shocked if he doesn't end up camping in June. And uh, that kid's going to end up in this Ohio State class. I just I feel pretty confident in that. Cool. Just sometimes kids need to like not listen to people on the outside, like what the expectation is from media or other coaches at other schools. Like that's if that gets into your head, then all of a sudden you can become really disappointed about something that didn't happen, even though two months ago you would have never imagined it would happen. So it, it's weird how the expectation changes based on virtually nothing. Yep. Speaking of kids that are going to end up in the class, um, a couple of weeks ago we were on here and you were giving everybody all sorts of hope and optimism on David Sanders, the nation's number one tackle, and <laughs> telling, every, telling everybody he was going to end up in the class. And no, I'm just kidding. I'm partially serious. I, partially, I, uh, I, I, I really believe that Ohio State is in the fight. And then he releases the top six, and uh, you know Ohio State's in it. It's the only team that's outside of of the the southern footprint that's involved. Then he, you know, the conversation was he was expected to be visiting Ohio State on March 22nd. That's what I had heard from multiple people. He didn't deny that. He said he thought that was going to be the case and was still working on the details, but that was the expectation. Um, and then the the list of, of visits gets released and six schools in his top group, five of them get visits. Ohio State doesn't. So um, the reasons for that are going to be probably open to interpretation. Um, I know that it's going to sound weird but like in this world like there's still things that ohio state is not going to do to get a kid on campus for an unofficial visit and um so you have to find a way to to deal with that um and and to win that relationship a different way so uh, i i believe that david sanders is fully expecting to take an official visit to ohio state in june that he has not said that he's not um but you do have to wonder, like, you know, is this a, a battle Ohio State is just not going to be able to play on the same footing that other schools are? That's the way it goes. I mean, I'm going to say that as gently as I can. I don't, I don't want to, I'm not, I don't even, I don't blame the kid or anyone else for it. Like, this is just the world we're living in now. And Ohio State, it, despite the fact that everyone thinks that they're, you know, they're buying a roster like they're th this is just not true. And it's just not the way that they operate. So now you have to figure out a way to to win the relationship um, and to be even more intentional about the the reasons that David Sanders is being recruited by your school and, and try to convince him and his family that it's it's worth uh, their money to get up and visit uh, at some point. It sucks though, because yep. like, you know, I do feel bad about it. Cause I, I mean, I've had the conversations with David. I've had conversations with people at Ohio state. Like that optimism was based on conversations that were very real, not just for my own, you know, poops and giggles. Yeah. Makes like, sense to I me. Like poops or giggles. I don't like poops or giggles. <laughs> um, just two more quick things. I guess, first of all, do you have any quick thoughts? Um, Steve Wiltfong, who's really good at his job, put in crystal ball picks for Jamie French and Vernell Brown two receivers out of the state of Florida to Ohio state this week. Do you have any quick thoughts on that at all on your end? I mean, those visits are coming up for both of them here in the next two weeks. Pretty, pretty important trips. If, if, Ohio, if Brian Hartline finds a way to bring in Javen Boggs, Jamie French, uh, Vernell Brown, and then to and Moore, like that might uh, somehow it could be his best class ever. And I, I don't know how he keeps doing it. Um, but the reality is that there's going to be a long way to go. Vernell Brown is a Florida uh, legacy. He's going to be recruited till the end. Th there are good relationships Ohio State has, especially with South Florida Express folks that uh, both those guys play their seven on seven with. So I'm not going to I'm not going to poo poo the idea that they end up in the class at Ohio State. But I would just temper the enthusiasm on, on like how long it will take for it to occur. I do think that. Maybe Jamie French is closer to making a decision than I initially thought like three weeks ago, uh, because it does seem like that relationship is getting to a point where he's he's buying into the idea that like he can, you know, really build something special with Tavian St. Clair and, and the Ohio State staff. Now that Tavian is moved up all the way to, you know, five star, what is he, the number six ranked player in the country according to 247 Sports. So um I am shocked at that, by the way. I am totally stunned. I never once saw Tavian St. Clair eventually going to be a five star. That's why I mean, never saw, it. never saw him. Yeah, I'm kidding. You're, 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 the, you're the you're the last one to this party, huh? Yeah. Um, 
Yeah. Uh, last thing here. So Ohio State obviously has their 2025 quarterback committed, like we just said. In the coming months, they've got a couple 2026 guys visiting. I'm not sure on the exact dates, but um, Jared Curtis, who we've talked about a lot. I think Will Griffin, the kid from Florida, is coming up. Not sure about Brady Smeagol. Haven't heard much on him lately. But do you think not having a designated quarterback coach is a bad thing right now, or is it going to hurt them in this? Is it going to like totally kill their chances, or, or what do you what do you think about that? I mean, Chip Kelly is the quarterbacks coach, uh, but it certainly doesn't feel like something that he's not. I don't think he's going to spend a lot of time like on these visits doing the little things, and, and that's where Corey Dennis really excelled was because Ryan Day was coaching the big picture stuff with the quarterbacks. And Corey Dennis was handling a lot of the day to day and like being the face of, of visits and stuff like that. So I do think it'd be important for Ohio State to get somebody else in um, in 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 that role. I, I don't know where you go. I mean, we obviously Ohio State lost Todd Fitch this offseason as well. He's now at LSU. Ryan Day's attention has been diverted and he's being sort of forced to serve multiple masters. Um, without having a true like quarterback assistant, I know that they actually moved Riley Larkin um, from Tony Alford's room into the quarterback room. I was told so. Like they 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 do have a, another voice in there, but I can't help but think that Ohio State should just make a phone call back to UCLA. Chip Chip Kelly before he left UCLA hired Billy Fessler from Akron uh, to be his quarterbacks coach. Billy spent a couple of years at Ohio State as a GA and uh, an analyst and is extremely well liked and respected. Um, he went to UCLA to be Chip Kelly's full time quarterbacks coach. And when Eric Bieniemy came into UCLA, Fessler has now been moved into an analyst role because Bieniemy brought his own quarterbacks coach as the offensive coordinator. And so, I mean, I would think that Ohio State, from an analyst standpoint, I don't know if there's a rule about how many you can have or whatever, but I don't think there is. So, like, I would probably call Billy Fessler and say, "Hey, Billy, let's. Why don't you want to come back to Ohio State and spend the two years working with Chip and and Ryan Day and and figure out, you know, where you go from here? Because there's a good way to get lost in the mire of the coaching world, and one of those ways is to be the quarterback analyst at UCLA, who's no longer in it." Ooh, what's going to happen there offensively for the next two years is anyone's guess. So like, I, I think that there's a conversation that Ohio state could really, if Fessler would be an absolute home run as far as an, an, an assistant slap, an assistant quarterback coach or an analyst at Ohio state in the role that he's at, at UCLA. So like, to me, that's a no brainer. I would, I would be on that phone call right now if I was Ohio state, but I don't know if they're actually in the market for it because like I said, they did move Riley Larkin, who was Tony Alford's, um GA to the quarterback room. So we'll see if they're if they can still play around with that. Yeah, that's fair. I I wondering I, I've heard some more rumblings about Michigan taking some Ohio State support staffers too. So you know the 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 UM the Michigan media is going to be playing that up as some enormous, enormous win again. So I'm just waiting for that shoe to drop here in the next couple of days, I guess. Yeah, I don't. I mean, I asked about that this morning on, on Thursday morning just because I'd seen the Sam Webb report. I, I mean, the people at Ohio State, if there's someone else that's moving, then they either don't care or they have no idea because the response was, we have no clue who that could be. So it may not be anyone that's incredibly important, but it'll certainly be played up that way. And so it goes. No one at Michigan or no one at Ohio State was gloating when Michigan linebacker Joey Velasquez transferred to Ohio State as a walk on. I guess we probably missed an opportunity to 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 gloat. We did. We really did. Damn it. Damn it. I always miss those gloating opportunities. I don't know. The, the whole thing is it, it it's funny. Like if you believe the Ohio State program is so soft and so terrible, why are why are you interested in you know pilfering it? So good job though. I hope you enjoy it. It'll yep. be fun. Good luck. I, I think it's good that the rivalry is back to being important. So after 18 years of complete irrelevance, Michigan has made themselves into the foil, and uh, I think they should be proud of that. So good job, and uh, hopefully the next 20 years are, are are like great rivalry fodder because I think it's the world is better when Ohio State and Michigan are both good. Um, now, it doesn't mean that people's lives are better in November, but the world is better because we have things to talk about. 
all the way into March. And that's what we're doing here on Talking Stuff. And I think that's where we're going to hang it up for this episode because the Ohio State Buckeye basketball team is about to tip off in the Big Ten tournament. And they got to win their first game so that they can win this tournament. And uh, that's the way it goes. So for Andrew Ellis, I'm Jeremy Birmingham. Please enjoy the Buckeye basketball game. Thanks for watching Talking Stuff on the podcast. We will see you later.